Pastor Dan, Pastor Dan here. It is Friday morning, and I'm taping this as myself and four other men prepare to leave to go to Louisville, no, excuse me, to go to Nashville, Tennessee, for the Lutheran Men in Mission Convention. It's the first time anybody from Messiah that I know of has gone to a Lutheran Men in Mission Convention, so we're going to see what's going on there. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Last week, we looked at the parable of the soils and asked the question, what kind of soil are you, to see whether or not uh, you could analyze how best to bear fruit. And the good news was that God was sowing seed recklessly and expecting that seed to grow and bear fruit. This week, we look at the parable of the wheat and the tares, the wheat and the weeds. And the weeds represent evil. And the fact that there is evil, even in God's kingdom. We're uh, in that whole process, we're going to look at a concept called docetism. Donatism, excuse me, donatism. Uh, there's three ways to interpret this parable. The evil, the, the, the evil one in this is the one who sowed the evil, the weeds, into the kingdom of God. And we certainly have evil that has been sown in the kingdom of God. We can look at the evil as uh, uh, the fact that Jesus said, leave the weeds grow until harvest, that can be an excuse for us to just ignore evil, even when it's among church people. But that is not the intention either. We still are people who believe in the Ten Commandments, read your small catechism. Uh, There are times when we do need to address evil, even among church members. But today I want to look at the concept of evil being those slaves who wanted to remove the weeds, but the fear was as they removed the weeds, they would destroy the good plants, the good in the kingdom. They would do more harm than good. told you we would talk about donatism. Now some might think That is something like this. By the way, David is going to the uh, men's uh, convention also. But uh, you might think it donatism means uh, what Christians do after church around the coffee pot. They eat donuts. But that has. uh, But donatism began in. The 300s, actually during uh, about the, the years 303 to 305, when uh, Diocletian was the emperor of Rome and was persecuting Christians. In North Africa, the Christians there were called Berber Christians, and they, the, the governor of North Africa would allow Christians to just symbolically hand in a Bible. And that was a symbolic repudiation of their faith. And, of course, they did that to save their lives. Well, well the, the, the Donatists were those who, after Diocletian was emperor and the persecution stopped, they refused to accept anyone who did that symbolic handing in of a a scripture or of a Bible to repudiate their faith. They considered them traitors. They considered them unworthy to be Christians. And any pastor or bishop who uh, had been one who had uh, handed in the scriptures, they considered them to be those, any sacraments that were done by them were considered to be ineffective. So uh, in uh, 313, the 
Donatists were considered heretics simply because their statement was, we want a church full of saints, not sinners. And the question is, can that happen? Now, I'm going to be very Lutheran in my interpretation of this. We all know, and you heard me say it so often before, Martin Luther coined that phrase, simul justus et peccator, we are simultaneously as Christians, sinners and saints. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, that famous Russian author, put it this way. If only there were evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds, and it were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. But the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. And who is willing to destroy a piece of his own heart? It's too difficult to determine the good from the bad. And when we do try to eradicate that bad, we hurt ourselves. We do more harm than good. So how do we do it? It's like a um, pastor I know who went to visit an elderly man who had not gone to communion for 50 years. And he asked this man, how come you have not gone to communion? And the elderly man said, well, I love to play cards. And when I was young and I played cards, I was told I was not fit for the kingdom, that I was going to hell because I played cards. Well, I still play cards, so I figure I should not go to communion. So the pastor and he had a prayer. And the prayer was for the person. The prayer was for the person who told him he would go to hell for playing cards. And once he had that prayer, and understood from that pastor that his playing cards didn't separate him from the kingdom of God. Once he learned that, he never missed an opportunity to take Holy Communion. Or the woman, who also hadn't taken Communion for years, for decades. Why? Because she had, she became pregnant out of wedlock, had a baby, gave it up for adoption. And when that happened, she was told, you're not fit for the kingdom. You're not a good Christian. She never had communion after that. Her pastor gave her absolution. She never missed communion again. We could uh, look at all kinds of people and see how they're sometimes (laughs) worse then they are good. But they do great things sometimes. Um, Schindler, the famous movie Schindler's List. Schindler was a Roman Catholic, but he was a cheat in business. He was a uh, womanizer, unfaithful to his wife. He uh, conducted business even in the midst of uh, a worship service in church. All kinds of things that uh, really made him less than desirable when you think about a a Christian lifestyle. But he did a very good thing. He was willing to see how bad the German government was in their treatment of the Jews. And he saved many Jews from the Holocaust. Just this month, in the July and August uh, edition of Christianity Today, they had a story of a young woman who said that she grew up Jewish and Lutheran. Her father was Jewish, her mother was Lutheran. Other than that, really, she had no religious upbringing at all. And as life went on, she uh, sort of ignored religion in her life until her husband was killed in an accident And her child, her her newborn baby was born stillborn. And her life went into a tailspin. She tried all kinds of uh, uh, 
religions, Eastern religions, and uh, drugs and alcohol, you name it. Then she started talking to Tony. Tony was the only Christian she knew. And Tony started by saying, I'm not going to try to convert you. I'm not going to try to discuss this with you. I'm just going to read you scripture. So she and Tony read the Bible over the telephone. They read the Gospel of John. And then finally, this young woman, her her name was Tara. This young woman, Tara, uh, decided she's going to go to church. And she thought, well, she better pick a church that will accept her. So she looked in the phone book for a liberal church so she would be sure she would be accepted. And she went to church, a liberal church in New Jersey, and this is how she explained what had happened. Well, they came to the point where they were going to have Holy Communion. She, she said this, They practiced open table fellowship. I had no idea what that meant. But when everyone else got up to stand around the fancy table, I didn't want to be left sitting alone in my seat. By the time I figured out that everyone was up to take communion, I had a choice. Did I still want to go it alone, trying desperately to keep all the balls in the air? Or did I want to admit that Jesus had offered himself up so that I didn't have to be alone? To admit that I had little control, but was infinitely loved. But she chose that day to be infinitely loved, infinitely loved by God in Christ. And I'm so glad there was that church in New Jersey, a liberal church in New Jersey, that accepted her, welcomed her, where she could grow and bear fruit. Amen.